Joanne, and I'm here with my colleagues Pat, Brad, and Paul. Um, and this morning we're going to present our proposal for the evaluation criteria um, for the high speed, high speed pa passenger rail, um, and which we've decided to call low cost high speed. And I'm going to pass it to Pat uh, to discuss our agenda. Yeah, please. Uh, so today we want to review, um, start with a statement of problem, uh, the issues on the table, um, and uh, what issues we're facing. We want to review the proposed criteria we believe that you as the FRC should adopt for evaluating proposals, as well as the, the barriers and the pros and cons of adopting these, these proposed criteria. So let's dive right into the statement of problem. As we all know, the FRC must launch and manage a high-speed passenger rail network. The, this will involve dispersing grants to local authorities, to uh, various regional associations of states, to um, a variety of forms. Uh, and it requires distributing funds fairly and efficiently. Where we come in is assisting the FRC in developing an effective evaluation system in order to fairly and efficiently evaluate grant proposals from various agencies. We created five buckets of criteria, and I want to start with the first one with the most basic, the safety. As we know, the FRC is an excellent track record of safety. The FRC has done an excellent job historically uh, to the present day in maintaining safe rail systems. We uh, believe you should adopt for this, this new upcoming uh, proposal system uh, safety standards in three following areas. Construction and maintenance, operations in the community. In terms of construction and maintenance, uh, referring to as the, the tracks are being built, as they're being taken care of, uh, we recommend you require projects to use project labor agreements that are competitive compliant with the executive order, um, and that will maintain safe workplaces to ensure that as these are being built, as these are being maintained, uh, there are no safety issues in that ground. In terms of operations, um, as we know, high-speed passenger rail is safe. It has been proven safe in Japan, it has been proven safe in Europe. Um, and we believe that if you require proposals to meet international standards, you will fund projects that are safe and that meet safety standards. Uh, and finally, in terms of the community, we recommend that you mandate uh, for projects that you agree to fund uh, safety areas around the train lines, uh, again, meeting international standards in this area. So clearing the hurdle of safety is important. The next big political issue to face is cost. So we recommend you evaluate your proposals that come to your, uh, your desk in terms of cost. And we recommend this in three ways. Applications, applicants must prove that they can work within the fiscal constraints of their environment. Um, this could take the form of, and it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but controllers reports or financial audits to prove that they have the ability to fund these projects, uh, to provide the matching grants. <clears throat> Next, um, we recommend you mandate proposals, agree to undergo financial and management audits to prevent three things, cost overruns, corruption, and waste. These projects will be highly politicized. If there are cost overruns, if there is corruption, if there is waste, that will only negatively impact the ability of these localities to follow through, to use the funding you have given them. With independent financial and managerial audits, we believe you can prevent these issues or, or, or nip them in the bud. And finally, we recommend, in terms of cost, that you require projects, require applicants to demonstrate the political will, demonstrate the political will to bear the short term and the long term costs. Um, we recommend that you expect and demand from your applications uh, some concrete form of demonstration of this political will. Uh, examples could include uh, bond initiatives, we saw in California to fund high-speed rail, uh, legislative resolutions, or ballot initiatives, some way of proving that they will pay. Um, so in terms of costs, it is vitally important that applicants demonstrate that they can, they can pay, they can pay well, and that they will pay. I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Julianne, to review the criteria around execution. Thank you, Scott. Um, so in execution, we're looking at two different, uh, we're looking at execution two different ways. The first is the actual ex execution of the proposal process, um, and the second is the actual execution of the railroad system, and some things to consider in, um, in the proposal when, um, when, looking, when looking at them. Uh, first, this is going to be a competitive process due to con uh, funding constraints. Um, we will just we we recommend that you that you fund the the proposals that best meet the criteria we're, we're laying out at this time. Um, we think it's imperative that the proposals uh, require a and have a detailed budget, a project timeline, and uh, a plan to obtain the matching funds 
um, for both the overall project as well as the next year, the upcoming year. Um, we, we think that, but that you should have a revision process, whereas you can uh, make, make recommendations based on the first proposal um, around the budget and, and around um, what you think would be better for the timeline and the plan, and give them time to revise the proposal and give it back to you for final consideration. Um, we, we also expect uh, and would recommend that at the end of the year, they deliver a progress report stating where they are in their budget and where they, whether or not they've met the goals of their timeline, um, and as well as the goals of their matching funding. Um, I think we, we believe that at this time, I, this, this will be a time to, to consider where, where, you, where they're going the next year um, and per perhaps reevaluate the relationship um, depending on, on their status. I, we think that the FRC should uh, provide the funds each year contingent upon the progress and the audit um, and their timeline, as well as their uh, acquisition of the matching funds. Um, some things to consider when, when looking at the grant applications is whether or not the, um, the, the grant, the applicant has a, a clear plan on where the track will be laid out um, and what land it'll be going through, that it's environmentally sound, um, as well as I, logical, and I, that, they, that they have a clear plan um, and can demonstrate that they can actually obtain this land uh, through whatever means necessary, but there has to be proof that, that they can actually place the track where they say they want to. Um, and then the, the other uh, thing to consider is the access to infrastructure. Um, we believe that they need to demonstrate a partnership with the train stations wherever they're located, and if, and if there's not currently a train station, how they're going to fund one and, and build one, um, and that they have access to the tracks at those stations. And now I'm going to hand over to Brad. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of the economic impact of this. Uh, this project is only really compelling if there's a significant economic impact out, especially considering the significant costs uh, associated with it. Um, and so to think about this, we first have to recognize that the world is demand driven. Um, just because we build this thing doesn't mean people use it, doesn't mean it will actually create an economic impact. And so uh, we propose that you look at how big of an economic impact this will have, excuse me, or the demand between the uh, proposed travel stops and put that up, the onus on them uh, to basically provide that information and to show that they've researched mm -hmm. that and that it will have a significant uh, demand for it. Um, and they can do this just through finding forecasts of different, uh, finding forecasts, excuse me, uh, forecasts of ridership, what they're expecting, and that these forecasts will be enough to basically fund some of the program going in the future. We don't want to saddle these, uh, these municipalities or areas with a significant amount of debt in the future, given that there will be upkeep costs of these programs. Uh, and additionally, we want to make sure that they understand the short-term and long-term job creation of this uh, project. Um, it is a lot of money, and so there will be a lot of different job opportunities mm -hmm. for this. And so if they can keep track of this, that'd be something that'd be uh, really helpful, especially to sell this thing in the short run. Because if you can tell, hey, we're going to create 100,000 jobs from this, and we know exactly what's going to be going into it, that's something we can really sell to the public and say, hey, we can keep the public on our side um, throughout this entire project. Um, and also one of the big things we have to look at with this is just identifying that this is actually going to be competitive mm -hmm. with the other travel options that they have. Because if it's not competitive with those, then again, people won't really use it. And so to kind of drive this home, um, we're looking, we looked at just different ones that are, that are just possible. For instance, the proposed train between LA and San Francisco. Um, the amount of time it takes to be in, a, in an airport and get on a plane and travel from LA to San Francisco is about two and a half hours. And so the train time needs to be about two and a half hours to be anywhere competitive, or else why would you get on a plane if it's going to get on a train? It's going to take me longer. Then all of a sudden I have to make the cost of that train significantly less. And then we're running into that whole part where we want to be able to fund this thing going into the future. And so you can see areas of this might be successful would be Boston, New York, New York to DC, those type of distances where we can actually capitalize on the fixed costs associated with plane travel. But you can see some place like New York to Chicago, it's long enough that the plane can actually begin to outpace the, the train. And so if you're going to sit on a train for five and a quarter hours, you're going to demand that it costs a heck of a lot less than that plane 
and also a lot of the business and travel that we're expecting on this probably would that, that about two hours may be prohibitive for them. Um, and so kind of another criteria is just the environmental impact. Now, we all like the world we live in, and we want to, want to stay the way it is for the most part. And so uh, we would expect that they would come up with some type of environmental impact study, whether it's through the EPA or whatever means they would like to do that, um, just so that we can know that we're not going to be destroying a bunch of different like wetlands or destroying a bunch of wildlife. Um, there are a lot of economic imp uh, gains to be had through this project, and so that does have to balance that with possible environmental damages. Um, but we need to know that those environmental damages aren't prohibitive. And so you can see we kind of thought about protected species or specifically land. Um, and another criteria is just green operations. There's a significant green initiative throughout lots of different enterprises. And we want to see that these people are being proactive in that. We don't expect them to have the greenest operations ever. I mean, they can do what they can do. But at the same time, we want to see a proactive nature behind this. We want to see them working towards being green all the time. And so that not just for these operations, but for other operations so they can set a precedence in this. Pass it on to the barriers. Hey, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Today we'll be talking about some of the barriers to this plan. Clearly, the first and foremost barrier to any plan is going to be the political implications and any political change. The FCR, or FRC rather, as a federal agency, will not be able to determine what's going to happen in this coming November's election in two years when Congress, the folks who authorize these funds and allocate these funds, are reelected, or even in the next four years. And this creates very troubling uh, forecasts because we're unable to say with any certainty that unless these funds are doled out to your applicants within the coming year or two, that they will remain there for the completion of the project. <coughs> Secondly, we are concerned with the FRC's ability to administratively handle this. This is a very intensive plan, a very comprehensive plan, but it does uh, place a lot of administrative burden on the FRC. And because of that, we need to know that the FRC, as a federal agency, can withstand the time-consuming ordeal of evaluating all applicants with this criteria. Additionally, you have unforeseen environmental uh, scrutiny. While much of the public can be sufficed with an environmental study by the local DEC, EPA, or other such agencies, there are some environmental groups that will not be validated by that and may in fact come later down the road when we approach or get too close to different areas that are not uh, tenable for development. Of course, one of the other ones is regional climate catastrophes. Uh, things like tornadoes, hurricanes, this creates greater increased uh, repair costs, overruns, and because of that, we're just not sure how the applicants would be able to adjust to these, given the strict criteria that we place forward in this proposal. And of course, one of the big ones that we got out of speaking with our commissioner yesterday is that the long-term successes are very contingent on these short-term gains. We understand and we emphasize in this proposal that you evaluate your applicants based on short-term successes first and foremost. Primarily because we understand that applicants, as well as the FRC, needs these short-term wins to prove that this high-speed regional rail system will be working and will be operational and can actually work. And because of that, it can continue. Now, we also have some pros and cons. Now, pros, obviously, are we weigh economic impact heavily. Job creation is very important, especially in this economy. And because of that, we feel that economic impact is a big driving factor in the proposal and in the evaluation process that you need to undertake. Additionally, we are controlling execution in this. And in controlling execution, this gives you more oversight into how applicants spend their money, when, and how efficiently they're doing it, and allows you to cut down on wasteful spending. 
Now, just jumping over quickly to the cons, you can see that some of the biggest ones is that it does create quite a bit of red tape. Again, this goes back to the administrative burden, burden that we brought up. And we do acknowledge in this proposal that there are very few com uh, comparison metrics. And in doing so, this keeps your evaluation process flexible because you're allowed to coordinate and you'll be able to coordinate with your fellow federal agencies as well as state agencies to best uh, develop the actual metrics per region. Additionally, this can become a long-term plan for evaluations throughout the course of the long run. And with that, we still feel that this proposal is the best for your evaluation process, primarily because it emphasizes the things that you hold near and dear in safety, economic impact, as well as environmental impact and cost effectiveness. With that, we hope that this evaluation will help you further your clients and your applicants process of moving Americans faster at a lower cost. And we'd be happy to take any of your questions at this time. Um, well, thank you. You guys have done an excellent job. Uh, I think been very thorough on addressing all of the issues that we had uh, identified for you guys to address. Um, <clears throat> I know that we hadn't asked you guys to think about kind of the implementation of this pr this program, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, what you would recommend for us with the actual execution? How would we solicit the grants, um, grantees? How, you know, how would they kind of uh, submit their applications uh, to us. I mean, in like an online system or paper or, you know, running it through the state. And, I, you know, and I do realize that this is outside of what we had originally asked, but uh, you guys were so thorough that I'd, yeah, I'd like to take it one step further. <clears throat> uh, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so, yes, thank you for your question. I think I, there would probably have to be some publicity around, uh, around this um, for, for a couple of reasons, mainly, or one reason is because um, it's exciting, and we want the public to know about it um, once you, you feel confident enough that it's actually going to move forward, of course. Um, but I think that's, that's one way. Um, but I also think that there would need to be some direct uh, contact and, or an email, calls, whatever it may be, um, with the offices, um, with the, the governors of different places. Uh, but I think there would be, need to be some direct contact. Um, I think also uh, grants.gov is a great is a great resource for that, um, and a lot of government grants are are submitted by through an online system um, or grant proposals rather are submitted through an online system, uh, which I think for ease would be the best way to do that um, and consistency with other uh, uh, parts of the government. Um, but of course, if if there is a system that you feel would be better as long as it's clear. Um, that can probably be implement, implemented as well, but the first place to go, I think, would probably be um, through, through the online system. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, during Bradley's seg section, uh, there was a question about, or there was a, there was a, a note about forecasting ridership. Uh, how do you think, wh what kinds of things would you look at when, when doing that? What kinds of metrics would you be looking at when you're forecasting ridership? Um, if you had to recommend. We had to be looking for specifically for the municipalities or who they went to, you should look at as far as if their forecast ridership, if their forecasts are well. What the, what the municipality, if, if you wanted to forecast ridership on, on high-speed trains, um, what kinds of things would you take into account? Um, you definitely have to look at uh, what type of public transportation system is already being used and see if it's a convertible transportation system. Can these people that are already there, are they using the transportation systems that are there? Because if there's already transportation systems that are there that people aren't using, the chances of them switching in to uh, a transportation system is somewhat similar, but just faster. Um, they may do it if the speed's good enough, but the chances are they probably won't. Um, if they have a car they can get from point A to point B faster than they can get from the train, that they're probably not going to switch to another train that's just a little bit faster. The, the ease of travel there is kind of a big deal. Um, so that'd be one huge thing is to look through that. Um, and I think you had some other ideas about that when we were talking. Specifically. Yeah, we, um, we addressed, and uh, we have this uh, in depth, uh, the elasticity of price on these issues is going to be a huge thing. Um, as we saw in California, as price um, increases, ridership drops very, very, very steeply in their forecasting. 
Um, so that'll be a huge factor in the relation of specifically how cheap they can make this in comparison to air travel. Um, that'll be a huge factor if they can prove that they can do that effectively and over the long term. That's going to be a big piece of forecasting ridership. Can you explain some of your decision to not go with standard metrics? I think that in your presentation you went away from standard metrics, if I, if I understood it correctly. Because um, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about if I was a local government, I would pump up my, my ridership estimates to absurd levels to try and get this grant. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering how you would control the, like, those kinds of things. Do you, sorry, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Do, do you mean specifically for the forecasting ridership or in general across the presentation? Um, in general, but that's the biggest example that stuck out to me. And with that one, we would actually almost not require, but uh, encourage some outside forecast mm -hmm. there using some weather economic consulting for the weather to be Deloitte or whether it be some other consulting firm they felt had specific expertise in their region. Because um, like you said, their incentive is to pop, oh, my ridership's going to be great, <laughs> right? And so have some quantifiable measure, which they've gone through, maybe they've, they've hired some economists to come in and look at this and say, hey, is this some tenable option that we can actually pursue? Um, so that's kind of what we would hope that they would be going through. And um, although we don't necessarily want to require that, we would definitely um, strongly encourage that type of yeah. I'm sorry. And as just a quick side note on that, I think you'll see that this is such a complex project. It's obviously so complex to, to implement, to evaluate, that we do rely, and uh, we believe you will need to rely on some outside sources in terms of the environmental impact report, um, in terms of um, forecasting and demand. Um, there will be times when it's because of the complexity and just the scope of these projects that you're evaluating, outside sources will be relied upon. Actually, one question. Can you go back to your uh, your your fiscal constraints slide? I think it was your your second criteria, the cost slide. Oh okay. yeah. Oh, go keep going. You just passed that. It's too too ahead of where you were. Sorry. There you go. There we go. What would a top score of the first bullet point look like? Like, what would the ideal candidate look, look like for the top bullet point? Okay. Well, so it's going to look different in every place. Um, and it's going to look different based on what uh, type of applicant it is. Um, if it's, for example, let's say California applying. California is obviously a single state. We're going to see evidence of, um, and California is obviously a state that wants to pursue high speed rail, but has many, an understatement of the century, many fiscal constraints. Um, they would need to prove that they can fund it, um, whether through bonds, whether through, um, so they're below their borrowing limit, um, through tax increases, um, through, uh, through whatever form of, um, of uh, revenue raising they're going to pursue. That, that'll look different for them. If it was in the Northeast, you might see a consortium of states. So obviously, it'd be a little more complicated. We couldn't just rely on uh, one comptroller's report. It would be a combination of the economic climate for each of those states as well as some way of aggregating the overall economic climate for all of those states. So I guess, long story short, it's going to look different based on who's applying and what structure they're applying as. The main thing you're trying to measure is, can the person that we're partnering with actually pay for this thing? Exactly, okay. yes. Long story short, can they pay? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, thank you. All right.